Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing open source versus commercial vendor software in the enterprise. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find and open both the Q&A and the chat sections, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake streaming, and data integration products. William is a leading global influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the incorporated 5,000 list. And with that, I will give Give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello and thank you, Shannon, and welcome everybody. I am excited about the topic today, and I trust that you can see my screen now. It's about open source, and like most of my presentations, it comes from client interaction. It comes from client questions about is open source viable for me for production in the enterprise? Do I need a commercial vendor on top of this if I don't need the functionality that they provide or the managed service or what have you? And so because I've, I've been getting this question quite a bit, um, I raised this as a presentation and do know that I'm going to lay out some of my biases to begin with. So when I started in technology, open source wasn't really a thing. And it came along uh, in the first, I don't know, decade, I guess, of my career. It sort of grew to where it became something that we all had to uh, contend with in one way or another. And the big gorilla there was Linux. And as that grew as a very popular operating system platform, and it was open source, it made us really think hard uh, about open source. And it's only increased since then and become what it is today, a hugely uh, popular way of developing software and getting software out there into the enterprise. And of course, the vendor community is all over open source as well, really hopping on, on, to, on, on a lot of open source projects, taking them forward for commercial success, uh, and so on. However, does that mean that we are necessarily needing to uh, consider open source for our production and doing it without a, a vendor? Those are some of the questions that I want to lay out all the parameters for so you can make a decision. Obviously, we're not going into every piece of open source software. I do have some examples, but I think the things that uh, I'll share with you can generally apply and really help you out with some of those decisions. And a lot of those questions, frankly, come from executive management because they're there like me was at one point anyway, unfamiliar with open source. And so it does it does make sense. It is something that enterprises have to address. Now you might be interested that the first open source project, at least the first one that got popular and was recognized as such is the Free Software Foundation's GNU project. And that was in 1983. And this was aimed to develop a free and open source Unix-like OS called GNU. And I don't know about GNU anymore, but it did get the ball rolling. Now, what is open source? Now, I'm going to start with, I think, what is the standard definition? And it comes from this website called the Open Source Definition. And uh, I, I've heard this referenced many times uh, in my conversations. So... I use it as a, a premier definition of open source. And these are the tenants. And feel free to go out to the, their website. It's a, it's a small website, not a lot there, but a little bit more definition on all of these things. But free redistribution, uh, keyword there, free. Um, I'm not even sure we would have an open source market if there wasn't some free uh, to it. Of course, uh, it's cost savings 
is a big attraction in open source. The source code must be made available. Derived works must be made possible. There must be integrity of the author's source code, which has led to some organizations popping up that really help out with that aspect of it. And I'll get to that. There must be no discrimination against persons or groups, against fields of endeavor, and the distribution of the license. And in particular, what that means is that the rights attached to the program must apply to all to whom the program is redistributed without the need for execution of any additional license by those parties. Okay, license must not be specific to a product, must not restrict other software, and must be technology neutral. So that's the premier definition of open source. Most open source or what we refer to as open source or what vendors refer to as open source does meet all of this criteria. However, that is changing recently. And I think that's a strong trend in open source. So does all this matter anymore? Are things open enough? The underlying license, it turns out it's, I think it's really less important than the ease that we're able to get at the software, such as in GitHub. So GitHub, cloud software, these things are starting to um, eat into this solid definition here of open source. So there's some, uh, there's some uh, cutting back, I guess, of some of these bullets and a lot of what is called open source today. So for example, Meta's license for the Llama models, and I'll get to this in a little bit more detail, but their, their models and their code does not meet this standard. Specifically, it puts restrictions on commercial use for some users, that's source code restrictions, and also restricts the use of the model and software for certain purposes, which I believe you cannot use it for commercial purposes, which, wow, that's heavy. That's a lot. So uh, that, but they call themselves open source. So I guess buyer beware, but let's drill in a little bit on this open source definition. Open source software is software that is distributed with its source code, giving anyone the right to use, study, change, and distribute. It's also often developed and maintained by a community of volunteers, such as what I show you here in, the, in a couple of uh, uh, graphics, the Apache Software Foundation. We're probably all familiar with Apache. A lot of the stuff I use comes from Apache. And then cloud native, a lot of the Kubernetes uh, related software comes from cloud native. Now I went to KubeCon, which is a great conference. And that's their conference, the CNCF conference. Uh, I highly recommend it if you get a chance to go. So I'm a little bit more familiar with CNCF, but I think they're both kind of relatively the same. Open source software is often more reliable and secure, not always. And I do believe that there that you need to scrutinize open source software more for these things. It's often more affordable than proprietary software. Yeah, but it's not free. It's free to use and distribute. Yeah, the software is free, but you will pay more. Generally speaking, you will pay more in labor costs for open source software than you will for commercial software. Now, does it balance out? I will show you some examples from my practice a little bit later to see where that falls. Open source software is often more customizable than proprietary software. Yeah, absolutely. You can roll up the sleeves, fork the software, put in what you want. Maybe it gets pulled back into the uh, the, the core, maybe not, but you, you can do with it what you want. And that is really a big part of the idea. So again, I'll come back to when I started working with databases uh, 30 years ago, the operating system for all commercial units. I was working on um, OS 390 at the time uh, at IBM. It's still around, still viable, of course, but uh, a lot of these have gone by the wayside. There was IBM AIX, APUX, Sun Solaris, SCO Unix. Okay, these are all like ancient for a lot of you, right? But today it's all, all Linux, but we had those commercial operating systems back in the day. Open source software has won the day for enterprise operating systems. So the question becomes, what else is it gonna win the day for? Databases? I don't know. It's really up in the air about databases. Probably not, I would say. Uh, and then so much more. I'm gonna use some database examples as we go along here because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, and I think a lot of people on this call would be interested in that. So let's, let's drill in a little bit more. 
open source software is often more innovative than proprietary software because they're not the, the the developers are not bound really by very much. They can do what they want. Open source software is often more transparent, okay, because you got the source code available. A lot of people will will say, well, I'm afraid of doing business with you, Mr. Vendor X, because you might go out of business. So will you give us all the source code just in case? And um, I, I often roll my eyes at stuff like that because I'm not sure what an enterprise would do with all that source code. But anyway, open source software is often more ethical, um, more supportive. There's, it's, it generally does have a community feel to it. Uh, and you will have to rely on the community. And I suggest, and I think everyone would suggest in, in the open source world that you be a part of that community and you give and take to the community. That's what makes it work really well. Open source software is often more sustainable than proprietary software because it's not controlled by a single company that may go out of business. Yep, that is the theory behind it all. So uh, developers that I speak to really like open source. And part of the reason why is because their applications will be portable. Great. Like, let's take MySQL, for example. If you develop something in MySQL, it's going to be transferable between clouds with hardly any work required. And that is great. And that opens up the possibilities. Um, it makes a, a developer's skills uh, more valuable because if you're deploying your skills on open source software that's so uh, leverageable across different clouds, different uh, platforms and so on, um, you're, you're gonna be more applicable in many more ways. So developers like open source. Doesn't mean we should definitely use it based on that, but the, they will advocate for it. So the stages of open source, and I'm gonna use uh, again CNCF because I'm most familiar with that. Software goes through stages uh, in open source. The sandbox stage is for early stage projects that have the potential to become projects. So CNCF is not gonna let something in the quote unquote sandbox stage that doesn't have the potential. So they have to be, um, they have to be open source or called open source, right? And licensed under a CNCF approved license. They have to have a community of developers and users who are actively contributing to the project. So you don't bring your idea to CNCF, you bring your project that's in development and has a at least a small community. You must have a roadmap as well. And that roadmap must look like, at least to the volunteers of CNCF, like it's going places, like it has the potential to really find its way into a lot of enterprises. And uh, yeah, like I, I did say volunteers. There are volunteers behind these committees like CNCF. Now, the incubation stage, that's really where uh, the software takes off, at least a, a bit. And you develop the, your community even more at this stage. Uh, you've demonstrated that you can meet performance and reliability requirements of the CNCF team and its users. Uh, and finally, you graduate to the so-called graduation phase. And I know a lot of enterprises that they don't even want an enterprise supported or uh, yeah, an enterprise supported open source project unless it's met the graduation phase. So they've met all the criteria for everything else. They've been in the incubation stage for six months, roughly speaking, six months, six months plus. And they have demonstrated that they can be used in production environments. So you got production accounts going before you graduate. So it's a pretty rigorous process. And thank you to all the volunteers uh, at these organizations that, that do this great work. There's also some different licensing models that you have to be familiar with in open source. And the big ones are, there's a permissive license. So this is like Apache uh, license 2.0, the MIT license or BSD3 clause license. These allow users to do almost anything with the software, including use it in commercial products. And then there's copyleft licenses that require that any derivative works of the software also be released under the same license. So it's more work, it's still open source. This is like GNU, GPL, Mozilla, uh, what else, Eclipse. So if you want to encourage people to use your code in their own projects, including commercial products, then a permissive license is a good choice. 
If you want to ensure that your code remains free and open source, a copyleft license works for that. So a couple different licensing models for software. Now, popular open source tools in our field of analytics. And uh, I think most of these would be familiar, uh, at least to some degree, not that you're using all of them by any stretch. Uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL, all the ones you see there, and way more, and way more. But I put up, I think, the most popular ones just to show you the impact that it has, because some of you might be using these and not knowing that they were incubated through open source. In order to enable cross-functional collaboration and provide a more robust and up-to-date IT infrastructure and manage new risks that can jeopardize the trust in the software, this is why the software goes through the process at CNCF and comes to a graduation phase. Now, let me give you some more recent examples because these are, these are boring. They've been in open source. They've done the open source thing. We're all familiar with them. They're, they, I think they all have commercial providers on top of them, should you want that. And uh, interestingly, I have uh, this conversation with, with vendors that are doing this um, frequently. And I'd say they're saying that probably, it's probably around 60% of enterprises uh, that have gone with the commercial license uh, uh, above and beyond just the open source project. That seems to be kind of a running okay figure that I can share. Of course, they, of course, most start with open source. And that means that you have a lot of projects out there in enterprises that are just starting out and they're in open source. So the number probably would be higher if you consider that they will move on to graduate to a commercial license. So commercial licenses of open source products still rule. Now, let me give you some more modern examples that maybe not aren't as quite uh, boring as, as those. Some, some, some with a little bit of maybe spice to them. So Llama. Llama is a large uh, language model, a set of large language models developed by Meta. All right, so this was released into open source in February of 2023, but it was released accidentally. So it's quite an interesting story. Yes, a researcher at Meta was granted access to the model for research purposes, and they shared the model with a third party who, I don't know, may have shared it uh, down the line, but eventually it did leak online. And Meta initially resisted not wanting to go not wanting to you know, put this in open source, at least not yet, but they eventually said, okay, it's there, we're gonna go with it. So um, Llama is uh, going to be very impactful in large language models. Um, already we're using it in a couple of client situations. Uh, it's really great, trained on a massive data set of text and code and can be used for a variety of tasks. Now, Meta was initially critical of the leak, as I mentioned, saying it could lead to misuse of the model, but they have softened their stance. Now, in the past, Meta had restricted use of its LLMs to research purposes, but with Llama 2, Meta opened it up, but there is still a restriction, and I pointed it out earlier. It bears repeating that you can't use it for commercial purposes, and what is commercial? Uh, well, I guess the courts may fight fight that one out eventually. I don't know. Um, but uh, if you're making a product, uh, that would clearly be commercial. And do enterprises make product uh, with uh, with Llama? Uh, I, I don't know that they do. They do internal functions, uh, but maybe it could be construed as commercial. I don't know if Meta cares, but there's some grayness out there. Arguably, though, this doesn't meet the nice definition of open source that I put out there at the outset. Now, gRPC, Google Remote Procedure Call, nothing special here, really, uh, except uh, that it's made just a tremendous impact. It's had a nice smooth journey to open source and uh, the open source community has played a great role in this, uh, is worked out the way that open source is supposed to work out. And it's made gRPC one of the most popular RPCs in the world. Apache Iceberg Indexes, Yes, it's interesting how things shake out in open source. 
Apache Iceberg. Of course, it's Apache, so it's open source. This is the data model that seems like every database is clamoring to support because it's good for analytics. And we could we could break that down maybe another day. But uh, it the, the indexes that go on uh, Apache Iceberg, they are largely coming from open source, like secondary indexes, like Bloom filter indexes, which are probabilistic data structures that can quickly test whether, whether an element is a member of a set or not. And then zone indexes also, that's dividing a document for purpose of dividing and conquering so that you can uh, say, I just want to look at, for example, maybe the, uh, the titles of my documents or the body of my documents or the footers of my documents or something like that. So it's a way of dividing that up. Uh, pretty cool stuff. And it's interesting to me anyway, that Apache Iceberg indexes are coming from open source. What else? Jupyter kernel extensions are coming from open source and uh, Jupyter kernel, I think is a good example of bug fixing. And they, their community does a great job with bug fixing when they when the bugs pop up in Jupyter. And Jupyter, of course, very popular these days. DuckDB is a, a more recent, uh, interesting journey to open source. They are focused on the managed service aspect of DuckDB, DuckDB not so much on the enhancements and so on, and uh, making a business out of that. Now, that company, of course, is Mother Duck that's doing that to DuckDB. And then LLMs other than Llama, there are a number of open source LLMs that are available in open source. LLMs will evolve faster in open source and that has been uh, proven out. So we're talking about GPT Neo X 20B, GPTJ, Llama of course, Falcon 180B and Bloom. So different LLMs out there that are being developed in open source. So. Hopefully those stories put a little, I don't know, flesh on the bones of uh, open source for you here. So why do people go for open source? Well, number one is cost savings. Uh, some developers may argue it's just, you know, it's just better stuff. But I would say at the end of the day, an enterprise is committing based upon the cost savings, really based upon thinking that it's free. And it is free software, most. Right. But um, like I said before, there's some labor costs involved here. And I'm going to show you an example from our, from our practice in a bit here that may open your eyes a little bit to this idea of the cost of open source. You got your community support. Some view it as a benefit uh, versus an enterprise. OK, transparency, all the things I think I've already mentioned about the characteristics of open source. A lot of people out there see them as benefits of open source. Now, possibly also security and scalability, and this could be argued one way or the other. My argument about it is, yes, I do believe that the security, scalability, uh, portability, et cetera, these are all, they seem to be generally better in open source, but you got that those outliers that you really need to scrutinize, especially about security. And I have to bring up, is an enterprise really uh, able to do that work, to do that work that is required to make it viable in the enterprise. If you're not able to do it and you're not able to do some other things I'll mention, you should stay away from open source. Now, uh, me saying that, and I'll probably say this a few times, I, I, will, I do not have any reservation at all about going with a open source product with a commercial vendor anywhere in the enterprise. To me, that's just that just, ha we're dealing with the uh, the enterprise vendor here. And th their product just happens to come from open source. Uh, but uh, I don't have any reservations about that. The only reservations I will have, and when I share one, it has to do with open source directly into your specifically production environment. Test and QA, have at it. But production, that we have to be a little bit more careful with, right? Okay. Uh, what else is a benefit? Um, they protect you from high prices, runaway pricing, and uh, and it allows many companies to offer support, hosting, or managed services. Now, it's interesting, though. A lot of these open source projects, 
they do have multiple uh, vendors, companies that are offering support and so forth, but really there's one, one 800 pound gorilla per product. And some of them there's two or three, but uh, really there's largely one and that company tends to do most of the updates to the product. So <laughs> it's becoming a little less open uh, at that point, but again, uh, if if it's a, if there's an enterprise in place, that's just how they're doing it. Now there are some downsides. Uh, an example I can think of is when Oracle implemented the optimizer transformation. An open source community would have probably refused the change due to complexity, because the problem can be solved in other simpler ways, like by rewriting the queries, but because it's Oracle and they're not open source, right? Um, they were able to implement that. So you get some you get some uh, features and functions in your code that you would not get in open source because they would they would gate it out. Now for vendors, the advantage is advantages are are kind of clear. You get you get a starting point for a real enterprise company. The vendors vendor has to create the market for the product though. And in many areas, this will add the burden of competing against an open source alternative. With an open source standard, vendors can tap into a growing population of engineers qualified to help them build their products, while also having a much larger total addressable market as enterprises buy into that standard. Now, the downside of open source, yeah, there it's, it's kind of the flip side of everything I've mentioned. And, Sometimes you'll see the same bullets here as you did on the advantages. It's all in your perception. Document, but this is true. Documentation quality is going to be poor or more poor. Okay. Um, there will be integration challenges, security concerns. I didn't say necessarily that security is lacking, but there are the concerns about it. Uh, learning curve can be steeper without the great documentation, without the great training uh, and support and so on, limited features, like I just mentioned, ongoing maintenance always happening, seems like it anyway, dependence on a community. Yeah, wow, dependence on a community. Uh, that's a little bit different for some organizations. Now, some organizations, some clients of mine, I mean, they swear by open source, they're going to, they're all in on open source, but they've created a culture to support open source. When you get into the more traditional organizations, that culture is not found. And that certainly should impact uh, whether you go open source uh, in your production or not. But reliance on the open source community for support and updates can be a risk. If a project loses community support or becomes inactive, it can leave you with unsupported software. Now, all these downsides that you see here, they're not inherent to all open source projects. Organizations considering the use of open source should carefully evaluate their specific needs, right? Okay, so here I am and I wanna to contribute to open source. Uh, I'm, I'm listening to all this going, yeah, that's, that's for me. I wanna contribute. Well, there's different ways to contribute. We all know about writing code. Yeah, you can take a fork of the code, make your updates, and then the world will be using it maybe if it gets pulled and um, you can feel good about yourself, I suppose. <laughs> but there's also opportunity to test, write documentation, report bugs, that, that is if you're a user, help with support, or donate money. Money is always good, right, at the end of the day. So you can donate to CNCF. Uh, many organizations do, especially if they're heavy users of uh, projects that come out of these organizations. So that's all great. Uh, now, quick time for a joke. If I may, how many open source developers does it take to change a light bulb? None. They just submit a pull request and hope someone else will do it. All right, there you go. I'll be here all week. Now, you want to contribute code to open source, right? Okay, be sure you test that software. Um, you don't want to uh, try to sneak something in. You may or may not be able to do so. If you do, code that does not work, code that has not been regression test, et cetera. Um, that may be the last time you would ever contribute to CNCF or Apache, or maybe both, who knows? But how do you do it? Choose a project, uh, that should be pretty evident. Set up a development environment, fork the repository, clone the fork, 
create a branch, so-called branch, edit your code. You're a developer, right? Edit the code, make it do what you want or make it do what you think other people want. Uh, commit the changes to the fork and create a pull request. Now the pull request is going to get it into the main line of the code for everybody. The maintainers and community members will review your pull requests. Be prepared to address feedback and make changes. If your pull request is accepted, a maintainer will merge your changes into the main product project branch. Congratulations, you're now a, a software developer for the enterprise, right? They look at things like, does the addition benefit the whole community or just you? They're not interested in it if it's just gonna benefit you or if they can't see their way to how it would benefit others. That's what they're about. So keep in mind that these organizations CNCF and Apache, and there are others, I just am using them as examples. They are nonprofits. They host open source projects. There's also Eclipse, uh, uh, Mozilla, um, OSI Foundation, um, and there's others as well. But I just think I spoke of the top five and 90% of what you'd ever come across. Starting a company, to close source an existing open source software project is a way to start a software company. Congratulations. However, it's a complex and eth ethically challenging endeavor with some gotchas that you would not have if you started your software from scratch. Open source projects are typically built on principles of transparency and collaboration. So before proceeding, it's crucial to consider the ethical, legal, and community implications of such a decision. And if you're going to receive blowback from the community and what that might look like. So you have to take care of that community if you step into that endeavor. So you have all the same steps as creating a software company, but you also have some legality. You also have to engage with the community. You have to rebrand, refactor, offer licenses, support services, and all the other things you have to do in terms of running your company. So it's not a fast track to success necessarily, but if you're good at it, it does help you along. So that's all great. These are some features that are typically closed sourced. So you got your open source and these companies that are uh, maintainers on top of the uh, open source are typically doing things of this nature and charging you for that, okay? So this is where they make uh, some of their money. Enterprise grade support, advanced security, vendor integration and the ecosystem, proprietary algorithms or models, customization without development resources, certifications and compliance, et cetera, the things you see there, warranty and liability and all the things that we've come to, uh, to feel good about when we're dealing with our IBMs and Oracles and, and so on and so forth. Also, I would add, Sometimes it's user-friendly interfaces because open source interfaces are not always the greatest. So sometimes that gets enhanced. There may also be some industry specific features that get closed source. So the open source project might be geared towards an industry. Selling support though, it's really not good enough, I don't think, for a business model for these vendors. So the real meaning of commercial software, the decisions are taken from a commercial point of view. In this example, and the example I gave, uh, well, let me give you a new example. Let me think about um, Oracle. Okay, so they sell Golden Gate. We, we know about that, right? That's, that's for replication. Really great tool. Uh, no reservations about using it or anything like that. And quite likely, they removed the change, ca change data capture features from the database to get their customer to buy another product. And because it is closed sourced, you can't do anything about it. That's just an example that this plays out every day, all day long, right? In the commercial enterprise uh, vendor marketplace. But you can't add a feature yourself like you can with open source. So um, moving on, yeah. Databases, databases. Open source databases, where are they going? Are they more popular, less popular? They're becoming more popular. Oracle SQL Server and DB2 will stay for the legacy applications and open source is considered for new applications or modernization. 
That's the stance that many companies are taking today. So some may have migrated to PostgreSQL or MySQL, which are both, well, I, I'd say they're probably the top two open source databases. Now there's this website, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, DB Engines, okay. So this comes straight from DB Engines. Thank you, DB Engines. And you can see that in, in terms of the number of systems, commercial licenses are trailing open source licenses now. And in terms of popularity, same thing. But there is something in all this that I found even more interesting. And that is that it depends on the database model. It depends on the database model quite a bit. Now, DB Engines doesn't give you any kind of explanation for this, but it appears that, for example, spatial databases in their calculations, 100% open source. And all the way to the other end of the spectrum where you have these multi-value databases. Now, um, I'll get into this, but they are 88.1% commercial. So it depends on the model. We can't just say databases across the board. Quite a few different profiles here. So I stared at this for a while to try to, and thought about it uh, to try to figure out why that is. So multi-value database, let's start with the one at that end. That's like inner systems cache. They're often used in applications that require high performance and scalability, such as OLTP and data warehouse. They're also used in applications that require complex data modeling, such as ERP systems and CRM. So the market chooses commercial licenses for multi-value DBMS way more than they do for, let's say, time series databases, because I think multi-value databases are more mature. They offer a wider range of features and have better support. And in addition, some of them are designed specifically for certain industries, and you gotta, you gotta have an enterprise uh, vendor for that. And so they offer feature and functionality that are essential for businesses in those industries. So that's why I think the ones that are on the right side of the chart here are more commercial than the left side. So find your way in here in terms of what you're looking at. So make sure you're considering the possibilities. And by the way, uh, universities, they like open source. Uh, they have a great set of developers there, right? The students. And so they're perfectly comfortable with open source. And this definitely is a factor of, of you know, bleeding into the enterprise uh, because those developers in university are going to be the ones choosing their favorite database in a few years when they're in the enterprises and in software companies, right? So they're gonna choose like we choose what we're comfortable with. So now there are many enterprises using both. I won't belabor these uh, case studies, but not hard to find, not hard to think about if you're uh, in the mix out here. Kaiser Permanente, Mayo Clinic, JP Morgan, et cetera, everybody really are using both. and. Uh, these are some of the, to me anyway, these are some of the uh, headlines in terms of uh, how these companies have strictly divided, uh, not strictly, but have somewhat divided the workload inside their organizations. For example, Kaiser uses a mix in its integrated healthcare system, including Cerner for its EHR system, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for its operating system, and Open Vista for its ambulatory care EHR system. So. It all depends. These are, I think it's a great, uh, it's great when I see a flexible organization. It's great for, to me when I see an organization that's open to open source and yet still sees the value in enterprise uh, software. And the cloud, by the way, is going to, uh, cloud of course, becoming very popular and uh, comprising a lot of the software that we use now. It's it's sort of compromising some of the some of the value prop, I'd say, of open source because that data is available, or that not, that not that data, that software is going to be available in marketplaces. And as I said before, I think that's the real key thing that organizations are looking for: the availability of software. It would be surprising today to find a company with only commercial databases or only commercial software. Now, let me address the whole open source is free. So yeah, open source is free software, but 
I've said it a few times that your labor costs will go up. For example, when you encounter an issue or when a security leak is exposed, that's labor. Uh, it's generally unacceptable to run your company's core business with software in which you can't fix bugs or apply new security patches. And if you can't do that, then you're going to have to hire it very expensively and urgently, and that's going to cost you. If you don't accept all responsibilities, you probably need commercial support at the enterprise level. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more. Uh, the savings on a commercial license can be invested in support training and the team. You'll get more freedom, trust, and control of the software that processes your data. So open source is not always free. And commercial is not always expensive, by the way, the other side of that coin. This is why most enterprises do not choose open source for mission critical apps. It's this, it's this variability in the labor potential. A database vendor stopping its product is an extreme situation and should not happen anytime soon. But there are real cases where people suffered from vendor lock-in. Remember when Oracle 12 point, what was it, 1.02, it was out and we had no clue if standard edition was going to be discontinued. No news for a long time. Finally, we got standard edition two with more limitations than the one that you bought the license for, okay? Uh, of course, people could upgrade to enterprise edition, but the cost is a lot more. So um, there's a lot of other examples out there. Um, there's one from Cisco, um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into it here. We're running a little bit low on time, but Cisco reported a critical security vulnerability in 2021 uh, in their Java logging library called Log4J. And the vulnerability was dubbed Log4 Shell. I encourage you to look up that story if you want a, a nice Halloween story here for open source. Now I'll move on. Security. Okay, let's drill in on a on an item here. Security of open source versus commercial vendor software. Open source is transparent. Yeah, you can find, you know, theoretically anyway. I always say theoretically because I don't know that, that your company has the skills required to do this work. But if you do, you can do, you can look at the code. You can you the code is transparent only if you know what you're looking at, right? Um, the community and vendor support or lack thereof, uh, complexity, uh, commercial vendor software, you got your vendor support, you got rigorous security testing. Uh, they're not necessarily transparent about what exactly it is they do. You get the pudding when it comes out of the oven, uh, but you will pay for that. Both open, open source software and commercial vendor software has security advantages and disadvantages. I'm not given the, uh, I'm not giving the lean here one way or the other, because again, it depends on quite a few things. But if you're looking for software that has vendor support and is subject to rigorous security testing, then commercial vendor software may be the only choice for you. However, it's important to be aware that commercial vendor software is not typically transparent and it can be more expensive than open source software. So consider your risk tolerance, uh, consider the criticality of the application. Consider your budget, of course, uh, budget and risk, they go hand in hand. And consider your technical expertise, which is something I've been trying to stress. So while many of these open source software projects are well-maintained and secure, some of them have security vulnerabilities. It's important to keep your open source software up to date and to use security best practices when using open source software. What about that support? How is it? Let's get back to my joke about, well, submit a request and hope for the best. Mm, some cases, yeah, if you can't do it yourself. Um, the quality and quantity of community support for open source can vary depending on the project. Of course, commercial vendor software often comes with an SLA, which is great. You can count on it or you can count on getting some money back from the vendor. Consider if your team has that expertise. As an example for Postgres, you have the mailing list, Slack channel, Telegram, and of course, Stack Overflow itself. So there's different ways to get in touch with that community. Of course, that's a thriving community, very robust and mature. Um, I think you should assess the community before you 
I take on an open source project. Now, let me share with you from my practice again, comparing open source and closed source cost. Okay, we did a project. We've actually done a few projects like this where you get a commercial, we get a commercial vendor that says we want to show the world that it's going to cost more to stay with the open source versus adding us on top of it. And so uh, we went about it uh, open-minded, skeptical, of course. And this was Astro Streaming from Datastax, okay, with Starlight for JMS and self-managed OSS ActiveMQ Artemis JMS. So that's a mouthful, but we're talking about a commercial streaming product versus a self-managed open source project. Now with Astro Streaming, the arc now I'm, I'm netting it all out, right? I could give a whole presentation on just this, but I'm going to net it all out for you. Architecture was consolidated and simplified along with many of the management administration and disaster recovery functions inherent in a self-managed platform. The performance and resiliency of the fully managed Astro Streaming can keep up with ActiveMQ, the open source, without the burden of scaling out infrastructure or scaling down. Scaling was simply better and you pay for what you use. And therein lied some of the cost differentiators. We found that in situations where messages per second throughput rapidly and frequently spikes and varies, that's called bursting, Astro Streaming was two times cheaper in infrastructure costs and up to four times cheaper in total cost of ownership, which is the bottom line. Modernizing a streaming JMS data environment to fully managed Astro Streaming would have many benefits and capability enhancements, including real-time data integration, analytics, and AI ML applications. So it sets you up for the future better to be in the enterprise version of this particular uh, piece of software. And we use the OMB on this, and these are some of the artifacts. Hopefully you can see this, and you can see that the milliseconds for uh, the Astro streaming was a lot better than for the uh, open source. And the cost of maintaining ActiveMQ was a lot more than streaming, that's in the middle. And the performance was a lot better for Astro streaming. Now, this may be, you may look at this and say, well, that's an extreme example, usually not that divergent. And I would agree with you, but frequently they are. And there's one way to know, and that is to do the testing. So if you care about this stuff, uh, you need to do your own testing before you take on an open source tool. Know what you're getting, know what you're missing. Uh, bottom line here are TCO, and this was an eye opener for me too, frankly, because I didn't think it would be this dramatic. What is it, about nine, eight, nine times higher bottom line TCO on a three year basis. And another thing that we see, we've done this again, I'm going to say we've done this a few times. Another thing that we see is the more we scale it, the more the TCO leans in the favor of the commercial version. So if you're going to high scale, all the more reason to stick with a commercial ver version. So what are the decision-making factors? Cost, of course, always, right? Features, uh, customization, the open source tools are typically more customizable. Support, we've talked about that. Security, we talked a little bit about that. Um, they both can be secure, but get into the tool that has the track record that you can work with. Community, is that community robust? Do they really jump in and help? Uh, are you going to be a part of it? And I think I have a, if I don't have a bullet in here, I should, that if, if you're not really ready to contribute back to the community, if you just want to take, I think that you probably should stick to a commercial software. Um, be a part of the community. And that's that's another way that you give back. And that also costs you in labor costs, right? So there you go. Another thing, inching up your labor costs on the open source side. Uh, Long-term support. Yeah, your team's expertise. And if you're into if you're into open source to a great degree, you're com you're comfortable with it. All these things don't bother you that I'm talking about. Great, I would walk into that shop and say, yes, yeah, stick with it. But if you're not that, and I would say probably a good eighty percent of companies are not that, 
then uh, you need to be building that if you really want to go into open source in a in a big way. Consider your budget, uh, consider your compliance requirements as well. Some industries have strict compliance requirements that may require you to use closed source tools. So consider those as well. So where's it all going? The future of vendor software. Here's what I think. Um, and I, I hopefully I've given you a fairly balanced approach, at least until now, on this uh, equation. Enterprise level features like security partitioning and parallelism, better instrumentation, troubleshooting tools, blah, blah, blah. I don't think they're going back to open source. If you want these in a robust way, nobody seems willing to <clears throat> develop that, that <clears throat> excuse me, in open source. Seems to be more of a commercial function. I see more unbalanced situations happening. What's an unbalanced situation? Well, I kind of alluded to it on the prior uh, slide. For example, AWS, they have taken many open source databases from the community. So Aurora reuses MySQL and PostgreSQL. Redshift reuses PostgreSQL. DynamoDB storage is based on MySQL's InnoDB. Yeah, they take it, add interesting features, but don't give it back to the community. And the cloud provider notoriously is reusing open source in their commercial services. So yeah, there, that's what I mean by unbalanced situation. I see more of that. Um, vendors will provide a smaller subject subset of their features for free and enterprise features like backup, stability, scalability and encryption come with a commercial license. And I, I threw a, a news item in there from this year what is Google doing with its open source teams? Well, it's letting them go to some degree. So I think that's an indicator there. Um, there's a lot of other examples I, I can think about. Um, MongoDB, they relicense their open source core to the copyleft SSPL. So that's impossible to use their code for a managed service. So yeah, all sorts of uh, things going on. Elastic and Confluent. They did some similar things. CockroachDB also relicensed to the GPL license, and they have some restrictions now when it comes to embedding it with proprietary software, like for a managed service. So you got to be on your toes. I think we're in the midst of post-open source in which software matters more than ever, but its licensing is going to matter less. Everything is trended towards permissive, as open as possible access to software to the point that the underlying license is a lot less important than the ease with which you're going to be able to access and use the software. So my recommendations, bottom line here, from me to you, evaluate your needs carefully before choosing an open source solution. Don't make it the default. Beware of the risks. Make sure you have the resource to support it. Open source software is free to use, but it's important to have the resources to support it. Be prepared to keep your open source software up to date Contribute to the open source community. Now, there are a few things, and I list them here, that they've been in the open source community for so long. They're very ruggedized in, in, that, in, that, um, in that way. And so I wouldn't hesitate around any of these. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying watch out for these. Linux, Kubernetes, Docker, Prometheus, Grafana, Spark, Elasticsearch, Kibana, Ingenix, HAProxy. And there are probably a few others that I wasn't thinking of that would fall into this category as well. So, um, and they're gonna be there for quite a while. What else do I wanna say? Um, personally, I'm, you know, I'm a database person, right? I don't recommend PostgreSQL and MySQL because I know the market really well. And I can choose a low cost database or a database that will be low cost to you in any situation and help you keep it efficient. But not everybody is so inclined. So I understand why you might end up in PostgreSQL or MySQL. But if, if you're concerned at all, if you're not this type A organization when it comes to open source, there are alternatives. You just have to um, seek them out. Um, all, many organizations are just bottom line, not ready for this, maybe in test. Um, and I'm definitely, again, I'm gonna say I'm okay with enterprise supported open source projects. So hopefully I netted it out here for you. This last slide was totally 
my opinion, my consulting, um, and that's what that is. And, and I hopefully I build up to this throughout the course of this presentation, which has been open source versus commercial vendor software in the enterprise. Back to you, Shannon, to see if we have any questions. William, thank you so much for another great presentation. I don't see any questions currently, but if you have questions for William, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of the screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Um, it's quiet, William. Well, I guess I answered all the questions. <laughs> You're very good at that. You're very detailed, which I really appreciate and I love. What are the most common questions you get from your uh, customers? Um, well, they get comfortable sometimes with open source software in, uh, in, in test and development because so many projects today, they're on tight deadline from day one. And so... With the and the, it's up to the developers to choose their own database because there's just no time to involve anybody else. You got to develop this next week, right? So, so they reach for an open source database. They get real comfortable with it. It works in tests. It works in in QA. And then the question becomes, well, can can we just take it on to production the way it is? But when you cross that bridge to production, then a lot of questions come up, rightfully so, about it being in production. If it's going to work, if it's going to scale, if it's going to be secure, and if it's if we're going to have the support we need now, once we make this mission critical, and so um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news at that point, but some of those questions must be raised. And sometimes, again, you're a Type A organization, you got the skills, go for it, take the risk. Uh, maybe it's not mission critical. You know, it, it's all a big judgment call, and. and uh, in order to make these great judgments that, frankly, uh, leaders in this space have to make every day, it, it need, they need to be supported with good knowledge. And so hopefully I've put some, put some points out there that people can kind of launch into their own research on, maybe for their specific situation or maybe just in general as they go forward and make their decisions about open versus commercial. So I think that that's a big question I get is, well, it's it's working this far in our testing QA. Why can't we just move it to production? Well, there are some uh, there's some bigger issues there. It's the human condition, right? We we get comfortable with uh, what we know. Yep. Right. And, and and need some help sometimes to to be uncomfortable and push the boundaries and explore new things. Yeah, absolutely. I I I I, I want you to be open to open source um, and, and find some pockets for it, but just be careful. I love it. And and there was some comments here that, you know, you did answer all the questions and some they didn't know they had, which is amazing, which is great. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> well, William, thank you so much for another great presentation, really informative. Um, and again, just a reminder to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to slides and links to the recording. Thanks everyone. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks, William. Thank you. See you next month.